Great, welcome everyone. It's Monday, July 22nd, 2024. It's time for our regularly scheduled city council meeting. The clerk could certify the meeting notice, please. This meeting has been noticed in accordance with Idaho Code 74-204. Clerk call roll. Councilmember Jorgensen. Here. Councilmember Page. Here. Councilmember Rasmussen. Here. Thank you. Next item is Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Changes to the agenda. Anything from staff? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the consent agenda. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Got a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Uh, for the maker of the motion uh, on item uh, six of the consent agenda, it's my understanding that should be the first extension instead of the second extension. Is that correct? Uh, can the maker and the second acknowledge that slight change? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I move to amend the motion. Uh, with notice to item E6, uh, this is a Scribner's error, and this would be the first extension for Torn Flat Subdivision SUB FY 2021-0008. And I'll second the amendment. Okay, thank you. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, um, we call the roll. Council Member Jorgensen? Yes. Council Member Page? Yes. Council Member Rasmussen? Yes. Great. Thank you. Special business, uh, we got our staff reports uh, available to the council and, and of course the public, but uh, be sure and contact the appropriate department head if you have some other specific questions. Don't see any from here tonight. So let's go to F2, which is Development Services Department Notice of Decision. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, uh, permission to poll the council. Yes. Uh, council members, uh, did either of you have anything uh, from the notice of decisions that you uh, have in dispute or need to pull off that? Not for me. Not I. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, I move to uh, uh, leave the uh, notice of decisions yeah. with the department building official. Okay. So we're taking no action. We won't yeah. take any action. <laughs> I move for no action. Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll go down to item G. We got a public hearing on CPA FY 2023-0003, ordinance 1046-24. This is a code text amendment regarding the floodplain. Uh, Jenna, I've already had questions regarding the 500 year and what that means. Does uh does that mean we're all going underwater or what's, you know, it's that impact seclusion and so forth. So if you could hit on a couple of those things, that'd be great. Um, Mayor, members of the council, uh, the, the inclusion of the 500 year floodplain definition is um, something that FEMA, the Code of Federal Regulations um, 44 section nine um, does include. And so um, that's just added in to have a definition of where our code already references the 500 year floodplain, but there isn't a definition for that. Um, specifically for years and years, the critical facilities um, it have been required uh, to be built to the 500 year floodplain standards are higher than, and that is providing a, a definition. Um, and so the 100 year floodplain um, means that there is a 1% chance in any given year that that area may flood. And the 500 year uh, floodplain is in, in one, a 500 year event, like the 100 year event, 100 year. And so it's just further out. Um, and there will be no changes to regulations based on that definition, nor uh, nor does that change what the mapping, the FEMA mapping, looks like. Um, the The reason for the the proposed changes um, 
when the floodplain ordinance was adopted uh, was when the maps did change uh, initially, the initial um, uh, adoption of the new floodplain ordinances. And the city utilized the state's model ordinance. Um, and the city did work hand in hand with FEMA and the state floodplain administrator. However, last year, uh, when we had we were audited by FEMA, uh, the the FEMA did representative did find some inconsistencies in our code with the federal regulations, and it's really um, going to clean the intent is to clean that up and to make sure that there aren't any inconsistencies. Um, the the individual who has been working on this is Brian Seegers. He's a legal intern uh, housed in the Development Services Department, and he did spend quite a bit of time going through the, the Code of Federal Regulations to make sure um, that the consistencies were there instead of relying on the, the state model ordinance. Um, the one thing I really do uh, want to note is that for ease of the, the reader, um, he had suggested taking the same uh, definitions that are also in 87A and copying those same definitions into 84H. Um, the, the way that the code is written, um, federal regulations, the definitions might even at a federal level um, not be the same regulate or same definition. And so there are some definitions in this section of code um, that really need to stay specific to this particular flood hazard section so that they don't conflict with other sections of code. A good example of that might be the definition of manufactured mobile home. The building code has a very specific definition um, regarding how it's constructed, whereas the floodplain um, code uh, has a very specific definition uh, talking about how it needs to be anchored and they don't exactly jive. And so that's a good example of where the, the definitions do need to stay separate. But years ago, the city had decided when there's a consistent uh, definition like floodplain that's used again and again and again in code to just have that be a part of Title VIII's general definitions. And so there was some discussion at a staff level should should the, where, um, there's this, the definition that's the same in the two locations. Should one just say reference 87A versus being copy and pasted? Um, so that the reason not to have the two exact same definitions doesn't harm anything except for it increases the risk of error in the future if the city were to update in one location and not update in both locations. Um, and the benefit and the reason that he had suggested having it copied and pasted there is just for the benefit of the reader to not have to flip back and forth to understand definitions. So it's really a half dozen of a six of one and a half dozen of another um, on how that is handled. And uh, to note, there hasn't been formal public comment. Uh, last Wednesday, the PNZ did hear this item, but because of how the, the council packets come out, we were unable to get that decision to you uh, for the packet, but hopefully you've all received uh, the decision in, in a later uh, email. Um, they did recommend approval on consent agenda. And uh, we do have a verbal um, note of support from uh, Bryn Boise River Enhancement Network saying that they, they are in favor of this. However, we did not get a written comment. With that, I stand for any questions. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll open the public hearing on CPA FY 2023-0003, Ordinance 1036-24. Um, and did we have anybody sign up? Thank you. Uh, Jason? I think I've got one. Okay. And? Welcome. 
Thank you so much. Hannah Ball, 215 East 34th Street, Garden City, Idaho. And this is just general kind of questions for pro possibly a future discussion of the floodplain. I attended the July 11th information session on future flood topics. And during that uh, neighborhood meeting, there's always kind of future ideas as to how some of the flood preventative measures could look. One of my biggest concerns is uh, Garden City has had long conversations with the Army Corps, and there's future designs as to some possible flood measures we could use in the city. And I would just hope or express my concerns as to not building flood walls uh, until a last priority in hopes that we could always preserve public access down to the river. Uh, obviously, I live down by the river and I love people to recreate and I love just to go down to the banks and use the water. And of course, I would be very sad as most of the members of my neighborhood would be if there was ever clear cut and then a built structure. So I would just encourage council to really have the conversations and say, what else could we do? I know it's such a big, heavy concern facing Garden City, but really kind of understanding what those designs are and possibly early on troubleshooting, you know, talking to Boise City and just saying, what are some other flood preventative measures we could use so that a flood wall is really a last resort as far as the design goes. So those were my only uh, comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hey, anyone else? Our technology seems to be working tonight, so I'll open it up. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed. Sorry, I didn't get this in in time. <laughs> oh, it's all right. Uh, get real close to that speaker so we can hear you if you would. Thanks. Thank you. I your... had a couple extra questions. Uh, after... Can you give us give us your name and address really quick? Oh, for the... Sean McFadden, yeah, Sean. 608 East 52nd Street, Garden City, Idaho. Um, as Jenna defined uh, the 500 year and the 100 year floodplain, I wondered what the difference in the definition is for floodway. Number two okay. question, how many properties on the south side of the river is identified as in the floodway? And how is that to be treated differently than the 100 year flood? Okay, hey, when we're through, I'll get those answered. I think I know the answer, but I'm going to let Jenna respond. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Any anything further, Sean? Pardon me. Anything further? No, that's all. Thank all right. You. Thank you. Thank we'll you. get your question answered here in just a few minutes. Uh, anyone else wish to testify? I'm not seeing any hands raised. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, while well, the hearing's still open, Jenna, do you want to come up and answer those questions? Mayor, members of the council, my, my apology. For, well, I won't sensitive. touch the microphone. Um, <laughs> Very sensitive. Uh, so the, the definition of a floodway um, in, in layman's terms, I'll, I'll just give it there, is really where the river can go in any given year. It's anticipated that the river will uh, go to the floodway parameters. Um, and that is different than the 100-year floodplain. And the 100-year floodplain is anticipating in a, an event where the river is very high at 16,600 CFS, where how far the extent of that water is going to escape from the floodway. And so it's the area from the river and the, the flood plain is the area from the river to where that water is anticipated to go. Whereas the floodway is where the, the water is typically anticipated to go, um, not in a big event. So it's, it's the river channel. Um, this particular, and, um, this particular, uh, code amendment 
does it change the definition of floodway? Mayor, that is that is correct. So so nothing changes as far as the definition of floodway. It's it's an area that you're not allowed to build anything in. And it's the same definition that's been in place for a lot longer than I've been around. Mayor, that is correct. And the city does have properties that are anticipated to be in the floodway. Um, and the regulations are are very strenuous for those uh, that do intend on building things. I do know that we have a section of camp town that putting in a pool, for example, they have to show a no-net rise and do uh, an engineer analysis that it won't increase the levels of the, the water in the river. Okay, so, so we have properties that are in the floodway. Uh, you can't do anything on them without an extensive engineering mm -hmm. exercise. So definition hasn't changed. This doesn't change the definition. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And I stand for any other questions the council may have. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I believe the, the, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Mc, uh, Sean McFadden. I believe Ms. McFadden also asked if we know how many houses are on the south side of the river in the floodway, correct? Um, Mayor, that number? Council Member Jorgensen, we do have that number, but I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, I would have to do some research. And it's more, more properties than homes. Um, I can't think of any particular home um that would it should be something that flags in my my head but there are properties that are considered to be in the floodway um those property owners at least when they come to the city tend to know um, it, it's not an easy thing yeah. to deal with thank you thank you okay uh <laughs> there's no other testimony We'll close the public hearing on CPA FY 2023-0003 at next point 36-24. My recommendation, Council, is that we have uh, first reading this evening. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, before we make a motion, I just, um, I want to extend my deep appreciation and respect to the to the services staff because it seems like it was fairly recent that this council established a priority list on code amendments and to have this come back in front of us so quickly i'm very pleased so thank you very much and with that i would move <laughs> i guess i'll go ahead and finish this thing up um i would move to go to sustain cpa CPA FY the, the recommendations from staff on CPA FY 2023-003 ordinance 1046-24 and move for the first reading. Okay. Got a, got a motion for the first reading. Any second? Um, Mr. Mayor. Yes. And I and I would just move to have that read by title only. Yeah. Um, yes. Do you want to read the entire thing? No, thank you. Okay, all right. <laughs> and and with that with that uh, in mind, I would second. Okay, we got a motion and a second to read by title only. Uh, any discussion? Court call roll. Councilmember Jorgensen. Yes. Councilmember Page. Yes. Councilmember Rasmussen. Yes. Ordinance ten forty six dash twenty four, an ordinance of the City of Garden City, a municipal corporation of the State of Idaho, amending Garden City Code, Title Eight, Development Code, Chapter Four, Design and Development Regulations, Article H, Flood Hazards, Section Two, Definitions, amending Garden City Code, Title Eight, Development Code, Chapter Four, Design and Development Regulations, Article H, Flood Hazard, Section Four, Administration, amending Garden City Code, Title Eight, Development Code, Chapter Four, Design and Development Regulations, Article H, Flood Hazard, Section Five, Provisions for Flood Hazard. Reduction, amending Garden City Code, Title Eight, Development Code, Chapter 4, Design and Development Regulations, Article H, Flood Hazard, Section 6, Riparian Zone, amending Garden City Code, Title Eight, Development Code, Chapter 7, References, Article A, Definition, Section 2, Definition of Terms, repealing all other ordinances, ordinances or parts thereof to the extent that they conflict with this ordinance, providing all other ordinances included in the official code are still in effect, notwithstanding some provisions thereof being eliminated, providing for severability, a severability clause approving a summary of the ordinance and providing an effective date. Great, thank you. 
Go to item G2. Uh, this is also a public hearing, CPA FY 2024-0003, ordinance 1045-24. Uh, this uh, is uh, in regard to uh, code text amendments. I'm sorry, extensions. Extensions requests, Jenna. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, if this council will remember in 2023, uh, the council dealt with extensions, the ordinance dealing with extensions. And there was a finding within the extensions uh, that notes that an application uh, has to be um, compliant with current code and or uh, then there haven't been changes um, to the application itself. Um, that and or language in particular is is problematic in, in being able to utilize that. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, there's a memo in your packet from the, the city attorney's office really recommending against um, denying an, an extension to an application based off of current code. Um, and so what this application does, um, it, it allows for a two-year approval on applications and then um, really makes some of those findings very concrete um, and not subjective at all, such as it takes out good cause, um, et cetera, and just says, has the application, is it compliant uh, with regulations? Is the property in good standing? Um, and then uh, um, also has the applicant requested an extension showing that the extension is needed um, for reasons that are caused outside of the applicant's control. Um, and then it allows for up to three additional extensions. So a five-year total timeframe um, with the exception of conditional uses, which would be granted one year. And then if they need a building permit, that building permit would grant a secondary year. Um, and it would allow for the planning official uh, to uh, do extensions instead of having them come to city council every time. Um, and with that, um, this also did not receive any public testimony at the Planning and Zoning Commission, and they recommended approval on the consent agenda. And with that, I stand for any questions. Any questions? Okay. Uh, with that, I'll open the public hearing on CPA FY 2024-0003, Ordinance 1045-24. And do we have any signups? We have one. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Hannah Ball, 215 East 34th Street, Garden City, Idaho. And on this application, Council Member Page, a few years ago, when when we went to the one-year extension, I instantly looked at that and said, that's never going to work. Uh, subdivision plat process is at least two years to even get to where you're stamping a final plat. So I noticed you quickly, you know, picked up on that timeline. And then from then on, we saw every application asking for an extension. So I look back through notes today as to uh, the length of the general applications that we've seen and kind of that time period and when they've requested those extensions and such. What I've seen is even single family homes are taking about 18 months. So that that was something that I saw based on since that last conversation was about four years ago, kind of what that timeline was. So we know a subdivision plat is still about two years. So I thought that this code is still a little bit shy and doesn't really alleviate the goal as to kind of what I, I think the city wants to eliminate a lot of that um, these applications coming before city council when they're all looking seemingly like they're asking for extensions. So the one quick scenario I thought would be very practical since all applications were at that 18 month period was rather than uh, on section A, number two, it states, or I would, I would ask city council to have it state 18 to 24 months. 
I think that's what I'm seeing all applications currently be triggered under that timeline. So again, section A, number two, have its date 18 to 24 months. And then again, on section C, well, I, I looked at the caused by unexpected factors. I thought that section of code was vague and created additional work for staff. Uh, so I thought a simple solution to that one would be putting two-year extensions for two years each. So that gives a total of six versus five. All it's doing is adding an additional year to that end, but we're seeing all applications being able to conform under that timeline. So if not, they're still a little bit shy on time. So that's every application that we've seen has been able to be successful within that six year timeline. And that was a mess. And then just from the field, we're seeing everything as far as simple conversations with who owns a telephone pole from seemingly Idaho Power being actually a turnaround of about 100 to 115 days as to the confirmation of who owns one pole, what we can do. It's still infill. And what I'm seeing actually on infill is a little bit more difficult to have conversations with who needs the power. Do they have the money to trench and underground the power? Have they coordinated with Idaho Power? Developer comes back for that coordination piece. We have to go talk to the residents. So we're seeing just on a simple who owns what pole, four months. And it's that it's that sluggish out there currently with just the basic conversations. But again, looking at all the applications, if you provided that 18 to 24 months, all applications seem like they're hitting that point of success. So those are my time factors there. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Appreciate that. Does anyone else wish to testify on this matter? Sure. Try not to touch the mic. <laughs> um, Jason Jones, uh, 208 East 33rd Street, uh, Garden City, Idaho. Um, I think what Hannah said was kind of right on. I think the ordinance is good because it is trying to address some problems with timing. I mean, I think just today alone, there are four extensions that were on the agenda. So, you know, there's no point of having those just hit the consent agenda and go through over and over again if it's something that could be reviewed by staff. So I think that's that's a good thing. I think the other goal is to, if you want development to happen in certain areas, you have to make it consistent and it has to be predictable. Uh, people have to know how long they actually have and when there's complicated processes. I, I think one of the things I told Hannah I would mention is my interactions with ACHD are, I send an email, three weeks later they reply, they didn't really answer my question. I send another email three weeks later, they reply. And so it can be months just sorting out one simple problem. Um, and having said that, you know, it's certainly, I think starting with a two year time frame is significantly better. I think Hannah's right that from building permits, uh, we just talked to a builder the other day who's doing a project on Reed street. Um, and uh, he said, Oh, we, we aim to get it done in a year, but it's really 16 months. And so why not just take the uncertainty out of it and actually have that, that time frame slightly longer, even on the building permit side, once they have building permits, if nobody's actually getting it done in a year, then why isn't that time frame a little bit longer so that they're not having to come back to the city? Um, and lastly, I think the, the big thing I see that I don't like in the code is kind of this other a request for extension is no guarantee that it'll be granted and it's this idea that it you have to find some cause outside of the control of the applicant i mean the reason people don't get things built in time is always outside their control you know people who've put money into property and put money into development they want to get done faster they're not like trying to delay and i guess the big question is going to be what unexpected factors, if there's a shift in the world economy, is that outside their control? Will that be something you can excuse? And if so, you know, if there's some uncertainty in development in Garden City, is that outside their control? It seems like something that's just unpredictable. And 
somebody who who goes, well, my investors are a little scared. Is that going to be something you grant an extension for if they come and say that? And I think that reading this language, I don't know if you'd grant an extension for that. And so I think that language should probably be cleaned up so that it's exactly clear what specific things you'll grant extensions for so that people who are taking a risk and doing development know exactly what specific circumstances extensions will be granted and when they'll be denied. So Mr. thank you. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Yeah. a question for Mr. Jones. Yes. Thank you for your uh, testimony, Mr. Jones. Appreciate that. And I just have some questions here. So with, I think, kind of from a drafting standpoint, um, a concern with putting every, uh, you know, condition under which we would grant an extension would, you know, we, we would never finish this draft, right? I mean, it's, it's we, we can't even forecast what those would be, right? Uh, to, I think to your point, that is yeah. your point. Um, and it's my understanding for the, um, the language of, of your concern, and I appreciate the concern um, in the time that I've been on council, I think, the big thing we're looking for is, you know, we have to provide a reason statement to to be compliant with the um, you know, looper rules that we have, you know, as a, a reason statement. And so sure. I think oftentimes if, if we just need the developer to say the words, right? And and sometimes, and I think we've seen a developer who didn't say the words, you know, and, and we're kind of trying to signal as clearly as we can, but why, but why, you know, it, it's, it's that we have to be able to make that reason statement. And, and I just want to convey that as maybe a reason. And if that helps alleviate what your concern is. Oh, well, I think what I'm actually saying is the opposite. I'm saying that I agree that it would be impossible to put all the reasons you might agree to approve an extension. So instead of having this statement in here that says caused by unexpected factors outside the control of the applicant, I'm suggesting it just be removed and there be an application. And if you submit the application and pay this money, that a, an extension is just granted because the real reality is that once somebody's spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on a development, if somehow, I mean, we don't see extensions being denied, but if you didn't have that language in there, you'd already meet Lupa. In other words, the reason you have to have this reason statement is because you're requiring it, right? Otherwise, if extensions by code are always granted, if the stuff is submitted timely and paid for, then that would be the actual requirement for granting the extension. And that way the extensions themselves would be predictable because um, what's created here, I think, creates unpredictability. Hmm. And sure, if you're saying we're always actually going to grant it, just give us an excuse, then why not just say, hey, we're always going to grant it. Just do the actual this, 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 these three steps, and then we'll grant it. I feel like it's safe harbor language, Mr. Jones. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I feel like that's safe harbor language. Um, yeah. We, I think we maybe all visited cities where construction has just stopped and there's a construction fence and really nothing, nothing happens with the progress uh, or with, with project process, progress of the project. And I think as a, you know, as a city, our legislative intent with something like this is to create urgency, you know, let's finish projects. And, and I understand um, that someone who has an, a, a bunch of money invested wants to see that finished also to realize their investment. But, um, I, I don't know, and maybe there's other legislative purposes that I'm unaware of, but I see that as my own. It's, it's first to my mind of why we don't just kind of leave an open-ended timeline for people. Well, I don't, I don't think it should be open-ended. I think right now you do have a three-year max on those extensions, which I think is smart. But I think like the reality, I'll think Meridian, throw them under the bus. They have that huge project that's stalled. It's never going to get built now until probably years from now, somebody takes it over and puts a whole bunch of money into it. But the reality is, even if like they did two extensions over the next two years, it's more likely to actually solve their problem than not. In other words, denying an extension for that project is going to leave the construction stuff up forever. And I think in my mind, like I said, making it predictable and saying to a developer, we're going to give you three extensions. This is the paperwork you have to do to get it. Here's what you do. And then we definitely grant it as long as you haven't broken the law or done anything crazy within that time frame. that's that's measurable. 
is much more predictable than having some statement that, again, there is no way to define like, what are those factors that are outside my control? Are they economic? Are they, you know, my architect really sucked? Um, you know, and those things are, I think, unpredictable. Like I said, if my architect quits, do I get to come in here and say, yeah, my architect quit, so I need another extension. And and again, I'm not sure if you'll be like, well, we talked to your architect and he quit because you called him an asshole. And <laughs> so that's your fault. And so I think those unpredictability things are what what is probably not good in here. And I also think having things that aren't predictable might not meet the requirements for Lupa either. So thank you. You bet. Any questions, further questions? Great. Thanks, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Hey, do we have anybody else looking for hands? See any? Okay. Uh, council, uh, I have a request. Um, council member Jacobs uh, uh, isn't able to be here this evening. And uh, for that reason, my request is that we hold this public hearing open uh, for two weeks. What's the date? Two weeks? It will actually be three weeks because we have five Mondays, so it'll be the August 12th meeting. August, uh, hold this uh, hearing open uh, uh, to August 12th and uh, so that Council Member Jacobs can participate in this. I want to leave the hearing open in case that precipitates some additional discussion uh, that those that have been interested in this issue haven't had a chance to hear yet. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, before someone races to that motion, um, would I be able to uh, to recall Ms. Thornborough um, up to answer additional Certainly. questions? Certainly. Yeah, we can keep the hearing open as long as you like this evening. And, uh, uh, but uh, Councilmember Jacobs has uh, a, a different kind of a solution he wants to introduce to the council. Would it be better to wait? N not necessarily. If you have a question tonight, we're here. Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, just because it's fresh in my mind, sure. and we've and sure. we've had some members of the public testify um, uh, art with great articulation, and so I just wanted to follow up with get some answer to my own questions. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Ms. Thornborough. Uh, does your office track timelines on these extensions? Is that, is that a data point you track? Um, Mayor, Council President Page, um, not specifically, but we certainly do have, we're tracking the expirations, but we don't have a list of, um, you know, 16, 18 months. Um, and, and I might state that really does change dependent on the, the climate of uh, what's going on um, at least locally, um, it, it will change. In my tenure, um, I've seen it where applications, subdivisions are being completed in a year complete. Um, and, and now I'm seeing it where subdivisions are asking for multiple, some are on three or four extensions at this point. And so there, it, it really depends on a lot of things. Um, it was certainly, uh, this council has seen a lot of timing issues brought up when there's a lot going on, it's harder to get through the process. Um, and then financial tends to be the other big thing. And then of course you have ancillary health issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, staffing issues that are, they're personal to the developer. Um, but no, uh, uh, my apologies, Council President. We don't. I don't have great data set saying this is how long different applications are taking right now. Um, I do. One of the things I'd also like to note to the council, uh, based on the testimony, is this isn't taking into consideration building code expirations. This is just Title Eight. Um, the International Building Code does specify that there's a six month or 180 day, I believe is how it's drafted timeframe uh, for the expiration of building permits. 
uh, city council can look at changing that. However, this the requirement would it is that it would have to be equal or better, and I'm not quite sure how you would interpret that. I would I would look to our city attorney if he has an opinion on that matter. So, thank you. Just one one more follow up, um, if I may. And maybe it's, I don't know, maybe this is a legal question, but in, in your mind, what's the legislative purpose of this code? Uh, Mayor, Council President, and Paige, I think it's twofold. Um, I, I do think that you already articulated uh, what the Garden City Code tends to gear towards. For example, in the Plan Unit Development Code, it says that you have to initiate your development within two years. That's a requirement to have the special treatment under the, the plan unit development. And so I do see that the code is geared towards trying to keep development moving along. Um, and, but I, I think the way that it's drafted here with a five-year time frame is also anticipating that stuff might happen. Um, for example, right now, people are holding on and wanting to keep their entitlements, but they're not executing those entitlements um, during the economic downturn. I think that it was helpful to have some applications that could go without having to go through the process. And so there's a balancing act between having having things that need to expire. Five years, six years is a very long time. Um, the the neighborhood, the 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 area might change quite a bit and maybe things that are six years old might not be as appropriate as they were previously. Um, but on the other hand, how much time is needed to actually execute these these applications? So so I lied. One more question. <laughs> Thank you for that answering that so well. Um, in your opinion, does infill take more time to develop than greenfield building? Um, Mayor, uh, Council President Page, um, I don't know that answer. There are, it, I think that it tends to maybe be trickier um, because you're having to deal with things um, where you can't go, I want the sidewalk to be there and that's how it's going to be. You're having to deal with your neighbors, et cetera. Not that Greenfield doesn't have that as well. Um, I, with the mayor's uh, day job, he may be able to answer that better. Um, but I, I think there are different things, but I think in Greenfield, you're still having to deal with Idaho Power. You're still having to deal with irrigation agencies. You're still having to deal with all of those different systems. It's just how do you maneuver them? Um, but again, I can't. I've never been on the other side. So, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, thank you for all the extra information you've provided with answers to Council President Page's questions. Those were very helpful to me too. Um, uh, I'm curious, like our code is very good and simple in a lot of places and different than a lot of other places, I think. Um, but I feel like this is something that could be standardized. So that brings me to my question finally, which is what is standard extension code in other cities in the Valley? Um, Mayor, council member Rasmussen, um, I, I can certainly bring examples um, and have those provided in the next uh, packet of our neighboring jurisdictions, what their extension codes or their expiration codes look like. Okay. Okay. And I guess if there's reasons that we should be different from your perspective, then maybe that information as well. Um, so those were just, that was just a thought I had. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, hey, anything else? Uh, the moment? Uh, yes. Uh, to Ms. Thornborough's uh, comment, do you have an opinion on Greenfield versus Infill? Well, uh, Greenfield is much more predictable than Infill. Infill is, uh, uh, <clears throat> you have a lot of opportunity to find out you don't know what you don't know when you get into the into the weeds. Uh, oh, gee, I didn't know there was an, an easement there, or oh, my neighbor's water line runs under my foundation, or fill in the blank. 
Uh, so, um, uh, so it's a little easier to, uh, it's a little more predictable on a, on a green field. If you do your upfront due diligence, it just, we've seen here, uh, uh, property lines that, that, uh, overlap, uh, uh, Whose responsibility is the Davis drain? That's a big one. Um, so it's definitely, in my view, uh, less predictable. Uh, I'm grabbing your words there, Jason. But uh, so, but you know, it, there's no standard is standardization. I mean, we we've had applications come through I, I think some of them that are um, single family homes that have been built down there and some have been a real can of worms and some just slip right through because the property wasn't cloud title wasn't clouded uh, everything is where they thought it was going to be by everything I mean the sewer stuff the water stuff the location of the gas lot and the so anyway, that's a general non-answer. <laughs> hey, anything else on this one for the for this evening? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, if the council would indulge me, I would request that we continue to hold the public hearing open until August twelfth, twenty twenty-four. I so move. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the one? James seconded. <laughs> Council President Page. Oh, I'm sorry, missed that. <laughs> no, I I I slip in and out of formality sometimes. So <laughs> tonight I said James second. Oh, okay. that, that's also, that's also my name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so I've got a motion and a second to extend or to hold this hearing open until August 12th, 2024. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. Now we'll move down to number three, which is resolution 1179-24. Uh, this is uh, agreement with Lyme. Uh, Charlie, you want to start us on this? And then uh, I think uh, if I can read the small print, I believe Hayden is online with us if we have uh, questions or if he wants to make some comments. Okay, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mayor, members of the council, I have a memo on this. It's on page 115 of your packet. Um, we previously, there were three different vendors in the city uh, until fairly recently. Now there's just one in the valley, that's Lyme. Um, and I think it's all pretty self-explanatory. Uh, one comment is the city's going to it's going to be 10 cents per rider that uh, if somebody gets a, a, a Lime scooter and it covers both scooters and bikes. But if, uh, if there's a rider and it originates in Garden City, then uh, Garden City gets a time for each one of those riders. So that covers our administrative costs. Um, in the actual agreement that is uh, on page 118 in your packet, it's attached to a resolution. And I am asking uh, for the council to pass this resolution. Um, but uh, there's one term in here that I'm still trying to ferret out, and it's called shared personal transportation devices. That may be an outdated term, um, so I'm just want to I just want to see what voice he calls them because I think we should probably call them whatever voice he calls them. Uh, Lime told me today that shared personal transportation devices is not not terminology that they use anymore. So um, I would just say I'd request uh, the mayor's. Um, so the mayor can sign this, and I would change potentially the one term, the shared personal transportation device. Uh, with that, uh, we have two line representatives. We have one in person uh, in, over here, and then we also have Hayden Harvey, who's on Zoom. And probably Mr. Harvey would like to say hi to the council. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Mr. Harvey. You can say hi to the council. <laughs> <laughs> hi, folks. Thanks for having us. Uh, Hayden Harvey here, Director of Government Affairs for Lyme across uh, the Intermountain West and Cascadia. Um, just our appreciation for uh, 
uh, your business and and your willingness to let us provide our services uh, in and around the Treasure Valley. So uh, I'm here for any questions and otherwise uh, look forward to meeting in the flesh when I'm in town next. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm seeing your units more and more in town now. So I think this is all very timely. Uh, uh, with the with the uh, exception of uh, the language change that Mr. Wadhams brought up, which involves a term you no longer use, uh, you generally in agreement with the contract. The yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any questions, Council? Okay. Uh, matters properly before you. What's the pleasure of Council? Mr. Mayor. Yes. I'd move to approve resolution number 1179-24 with the uh, exception or inclusion of potential change in language of shared personal transportation devices. Second. A motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, the clerk call roll. Councilmember Jorgensen? Yes. Councilmember Page? Yes. Councilmember Rasmussen? Yes. Hey. Very good. We'll look forward to seeing you when you're in town. Thank you, sir. Y'all have a good night. Okay. Okay. Uh, next item. Uh, there's no unfinished business, new business. Just want to do an update on where we are with our draft budget for 2025. Uh, I think all of you uh, uh, seen the draft, at least the latest draft. Uh, I did want to highlight a, a number of items here uh, just to, and, and then one item that I uh, hope you'll think about because there's uh, one area where I'm going to need the guidance of the council uh, regarding a priority <clears throat> or what's a priority. Uh, so the tentative budget approval this is tentative, uh, that will be on the 12th of August. Uh, and um, that decision will get made on the 12th of August and then we'll have a public hearing on the budget on the 26th of August. And that public hearing, uh, the council will need to make a final decision, a decision on the appropriations ordinance uh, we'll have to, we don't have time for a three reading. We'll have to suspend the rules, adopt and publish. So we meet our reporting timeline to the county. Uh, otherwise we won't have a budget for 2025. So they, they, they kind of short circuit the process because of the timing. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, <clears throat> the, the budget you have, uh, it, currently we are balancing that budget using $100,000 of ARPA money that we've been carrying for some time. Uh, the, um, we might see some minor tweaks in the police department budget. Uh, we're, uh, our police chief is going Mach 2 with <laughs> I was going to say his hair on fire, but that's not the case. <laughs> uh, uh, getting a lot of detail there. Uh, nothing major, uh, but we may have some minor minor changes there. Uh, the budget contemplates uh, a 3% allocated increase that's uh, allowed by statute in our uh, on our property tax. And then uh, we're recommending that we take 1% foregone. Um, and I think yeah, you're all generally familiar with that. Uh, we've got a 3% payroll increase for our hourly staff. Uh, our exempt staff will have a one-time kind of an inflation contribution that will not add to their base. Uh, and that'll be about $1,700. And then uh, time you add the Percy contribution and some other things, the net cost of the city will be uh, $2,000 a piece. Um, decision we need to make. Last meeting we had, we had a presentation from Valley Ride in which they asked for 
11,000, I forgot the exact number, 11, a little over $11,000 uh, for their capital portion. Uh, we pay dues, of course, that's uh, just under $8,000. Uh, in the intervening time, uh, we've also gotten a request from the library to increase their book budget by $15,000. Uh, so something you can think about, uh, if you have ideas, uh, you might send those to, to Lisa, uh, or we can discuss it at the next meeting. Um, I'm... Uh, I'm not going to recommend that we use our fund balance to fund either one of those. One, uh, you know, that, that's just me. We, we, we could do that. Uh, right now, our only fund balance draw is the flood study. And uh, so um, I'm going to have uh, Lisa send each of you a for the library uh, history that I had, uh, we've got a five year history so you can see how we've dealt with changes uh, to the library budget. Uh, it, you can look at the total number, you can also look at uh, the allocation for purchasing books. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> you have all the power on this budget related stuff. Uh, my, what I'm going to present to you uh, is I'll be asking you to fund one or part of the other or some to each, or you certainly have the power to say, no, Mayor, we want to do both. We want you to draw down the fund balance a little bit and do that. So you have a lot of latitude here, but I wanted to point that particular issue out so that you have an opportunity to think about that uh, between now and August 12th. I think the rest of the items in the budget are, uh, you know, uh, I think you're generally familiar with them. They are maintain our current service levels. And uh, we're, we're frankly uh, suffering from the impacts of inflation uh, that's driven our levy down to the point where our new construction, even though we have a lot going on, isn't isn't uh, adding to our base at a rate that allows us to be more generous in some areas. So we're having to hold the line in some of these. So at least what I'm presenting to you is holding the line. <laughs> so anyway, that's really all I had on that. Be asked, happy to answer any questions or if you have any specifics uh, you want to visit with. We're, we're anticipating that flood study uh, will be Another three hundred thousand uh, dollars, maybe a little less than that. Uh, we're hoping Jen is right, but that's a uh, that's something we've uh, been holding in our fund balance to fund. So it's a one time, one time thing. And um, I don't really have any more to add at this point. Uh, any thoughts you have? You've got our numbers. We're interested this is uh, this is an issue that is in the council's court so mayors can only pretend like they control that but city councils have the authority so that's anyway uh, if there's nothing further uh, that concludes our business tonight we'll entertain a motion to adjourn Mr. Mayor, we do have an executive sign. Oh, we do? <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Charles. We don't have to do it tonight if you don't want to. No, I, I don't care. Okay. Uh, I, I, I missed my, I missed my pre-meeting meeting with the city attorney. <laughs> okay, we looks like we need to move into executive session. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I move for executive session to anticipate an action item um, pursuant to Idaho Code. 7426 1 F. Second. A motion a second. Any discussion on the motion? Any members for call roll? Councilmember Jorgensen? Yes. Councilmember Page? Yes. Councilmember Rasmussen? Yes. Hey, uh, let's take a couple of minutes. Oh, sorry.